First, my name is Sharon Black, and I'm with Struggle La Lucha, and I want to welcome everybody to um, this afternoon's webinar, which is going to be extremely exciting in my personal opinion. Um, and I'm not going to go into a long introduction. What I want to introduce is our very, very special speakers. As people already know, the webinar is really about a report back, a live report back from Donbass in Russia. And also we have Margaret Kimberly here and both John and Margaret are gonna be able to give us an analysis. And everyone that's tuning into the webinar will have an option to be able to ask questions. And just before we start the program, I wanna make sure that people know to go and see where this is at. There is something called Q&A. And those who've been on, I think most has been on Zoom or Zoom calls too many times, but Q&A, you can ask a question or you can go to the chat. And when we get to Q&A and questions, I'll try to look at both simultaneously. So at any rate, I don't wanna speak long. I just wanna tell you a little bit about our guest speakers. Um, John Parker has traveled to Donbass in Russia as an eyewitness reporter for Struggle Lucha. Parker is the founder of the Harriet Tubman Center for so Social Justice in Los Angeles and a candidate uh, for US Senate in California on the Peace and Freedom Party ticket. He is also a coordinator for the Socialist Unity Party and a member of the Black Alliance for Peace. Our second panelist is Margaret Kimberly. Um, she's a co-founder of the exec and executive editor and senior columnist for Black Agenda Report and author of the book, Prejudicial, Black America and the Presidents. Kimberly is an administrative committee member of the United National Anti-War Coalition and coordinating committee member of the Black Alliance for Peace. And both of one is from New York and one is from Los Angeles. So we have both coasts with us here tonight. So I'm going to uh, pin John, who's first going to give us sort of a report, a wonderful report back. And I'm going to stray from what I promised. I want to say that everybody with Struggle with Lucha, you do not know what John Parker went through to get there to Russia and Donbass. And we were all scared to death for him. We don't have a lot of money. We wanted to send a second person. Um, but I have to be honest, we really were scared because he was going to the front line. And I'm just being very, very point blank. And we just, you know, we're still later, not on this call, but we will be raising money to cover his trip because it was a reason why we couldn't send a second person. So anyhow, thank you, John, for being so brave and going there. And give a so I'm going to mute my mic and pin no, you know, I was, I, was, I was thinking, too, when when I was there, too, I was thinking the, the folks from Barotba, um, the organization that was really um, made this happen, uh, and they were doing translation for us and um, and everything and, and risking their lives so that we can get the information back to the U.S. So I hope the anti-war movement appreciates, uh, you know, the folks over there who are trying to get us to get it right. Um, but anyway, I'm going to set my timer here real quick. Okay, since March, the U.S. Congress has approved about $54 billion in war funds for Ukraine. And since 2004, this will make the money going to that regime change for regime, regime change in Ukraine close to $100 billion. Uh, the Democrats um, unanimous, unanimously approved this latest billions being taken away from housing, food, healthcare, transportation, COVID relief, or any real attempt to stop runaway inflation. That's right, all of them, all the Democrats voted for that. Um, and as my comrade, uh, uh, Gary Wilson, who wrote in an article in Struggle La Lucha, uh, to put this in perspective, 54 billion is, is more than Russia's defense budget for the whole year of 2021, which was 43 billion. Uh, it's more money than the U.S. has given in, in any kind of aid to any country in the last decade. So we want to ask ourselves, how did, how did we get here? Which is a very important question and one that can be answered truthfully and in a way that exposes U.S. imperialism as the perpetrator and source to stopping this war are answered in a way which legitimizes the avalanche of falsehoods from the Pentagon, from the Ukrainian government, and pours water on the urgency to stop this runaway train towards World War III. On April 25th, um, at a meeting with more than 40 NATO and non-NATO defense officials in Germany, U.S. Secretary of War Lloyd Austin said basically that this is not about defending Ukraine. 
but it's a proxy war against Russia with Ukraine as the battlefield. He said, uh, quote, a week in Russia is the goal. Um, Biden himself also said that, you know, that this is all about regime change. Um, he took it back, but he said it. Um, so uh, I just wanted to briefly hear from uh, when I was over there, um, I went to Russia and then I went to Lugansk and, and um, uh, while in Russia, uh, met a journalist from Belarus who wanted to interview me and I wanted to interview her. She's a um, pretty uh, well-known journalist, uh, Nadezda, I got her last name, uh, uh, and she works for a pretty uh, kind of a mainstream newspaper called Minskaya Pravda. Um, now, you know, Belarus borders Russia and the Ukraine. And so we wanted to hear what she had to say, um, her perspective on, uh, on from the Belarus uh, thing. But first I have to share my screen. Let me share my screen here. Here it is, boom. And let's try this. Okay. Okay. So I'm Nadezhda Savlina. I'm a Belarusian journalist from the newspaper Minsk. Um, I want to say that uh, before the Russian military operation started, uh, there was a danger that Ukrainians attacked uh, our Belarusian territory. In a week uh, after the operation started, Lukashenko, our president, said that there were three points uh, near the Ukrainian-Belarusian border on the Ukrainian territory. And there were uh, heavy artillery that were ready to attack Belarusian territory. So Russian soldiers that were on our territory that time, that time they actually, actually saved us from this attack, from the Ukraine. And you know, when uh, someone in, in Europe or in the United States uh, says that Belarus is a co-aggressor with Russia, it, it's so disgusting because we were under the attack, under the dangers of the attack, and we just had to save ourselves. And Russia really helps us to... on the border of the Lugansk and Donetsk. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, did they have a credible um, reason to be afraid, the people in the Of course, they, we could, yes, they afraid, they were afraid, but it was not just, you know, just a feeling that they're gonna be an attack. There were facts, many facts that Ukrainian army, uh, that USA finance and help them with this military equipment and so on, they were going to attack, not just attack, to start a big war against Donbass and also against Russia and against Belarus. So people in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic just had no choice. Either they start uh, this operation with Russian uh, army, either they just die, because yes, the war had to be started. That time. the Nazi infiltration into the military of the Ukraine. Have you seen any evidence of that? What evidence? Oh, evidence of any Nazi influence in the Ukrainian military. Influence. <laughs> Ukraine is a Nazi state. We see it definitely uh, in ideology, in um, army, in society, everywhere. We see this fascist, fasci fascism. Yes. Uh, in Europe, people usually say Nazi. Here, we usually say. Fasc okay. Uh, okay. Stop screen share. Sorry. Um, Sorry for the roughness of the editing there, but <laughs> um, uh, just trying to get some of the pertinent stuff in there. Um, so there was another, uh, there's a whole article that um, that she had written that we can I, I can share with other folks. Give us your emails and stuff so we can share that with you. Um, 
But um, that I wanted to now go to, um, we went to this village near Krimskoya, it's called, um, uh, and uh, in Lugansk. Um, and that's one of the buildings where the Ukrainian military used to store their ammunition. Um, we went to a lot of different places. We went to shelters, we went to the other places. So just wanted to show you real quick what we found there. Um, you know, to, okay, let's get to this share. Boom. Right there. And there. If I were to take the paint to see how old this is, I could like scrape some paint off and possibly analyze it and see how old. Um, no, if I were if I were to take something and scrape it off and hold it, to analyze how old it is to see when it was written. It was written when Ukrainian soldiers were here, not now. Right, right, right. But I, I wonder if I could test that. Uh -huh. It's a good way to test. I am licking my finger here. And let's do that like that. Let's rub it really hard and see. Oh, nothing came off. Which means more likely <laughs> somebody not didn't new, just come and go. It's not new. And this symbol here, is that? Uh, this uh, symbol means um, uh, like a uh, circling of the sun. It, this symbol use uh, pagans, pagans, and uh, uh, so you see that the uh, fascist symbol is very similar to this. It is uh, uh, like a, a right. sun turning of the sun. Mm -hmm. This the same, but in the another uh, direction. In another, in another direction, yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, here you can see that. At this place used uh, far right uh, forces, but there are okay. That's the end of that one. Get back to oh, shoot. Where am I here? Uh, I am sharing my screen, huh? Right? I'm not. Oh, I wasn't sharing my screen that whole time? No. We could Hold hear, on. but could not see. Oh, shoot. So you couldn't see the, the swastika and the black sun and stuff like that? Yeah, you might be sharing your screen of you, but not of the... Oh, shoot. Okay. Okay. One second. Let's do that again. There you okay. go. All right, sorry about that. Um, that's not it. My goodness. That's <sighs> All right, we'll get back to that. <laughs> I'll get back to that later. Anyway, it was a it was a picture of the black sun and the swastika and things. I'll I'll, I'll get that up again. Um, so real quick, let's just get this one, and then that's that's it. Now this was people can hear me. This was um, in Rubizny, uh, one of the shelters that uh, close to the front lines where uh, 350 people had uh, come to to get rescued because they were getting bombarded by uh, Ukrainian military tanks. So here's just um, one of the people. Uh, we went uh, into the shelter downstairs in the shelter to talk to some of the people who were living there. Uh, we were very frightened. People were very frightened. I'm not sharing it. Hold on. They, uh, uh, ran out from this Houses and shout, What are you doing? We are Ukrainians. 
продолжать? Ну, это не помогло. Сами солдаты походили, улыбнулись и отворачивались от горячих домов. Вышла и я. И я сначала думаю, кто именно нас расстреливает. Когда я узнала, что это Украина, осмелилась сама выйти. У меня дом был крайний по улице. И я вышла, как сказала, ребята, ну я начала говорить по-украински. Хотя мой родной по-русски. Uh, я сейчас переведу. And, um... When uh, people uh, began to run out uh, on the streets and uh, shout, uh, don't do this, we, we are Ukrainians, uh, the soldiers just laughed and hided uh, their love and uh, uh, turned their faces from this burned house. And uh, she uh, went out from, the, from her uh, house because he, uh, she wanted to um, understand who uh, exactly uh, shot it. Uh, in, in, in her house and uh, uh, her house was uh, on the edge of this uh, city and uh, she came to Ukrainian uh, soldier uh, and uh, um, began to speak with him in Ukrainian but her native uh, language is Russian language <laughs> начал мой дом, мой двор расстреливать Uh, maybe 20 minutes passed and uh, uh, one more Ukrainian tank came and began to shoot exactly directly in her house. Ooh. And how does she... Okay, let's stop that there. Oh, because um, I could do a lot more, but I don't want to take away from Margaret's great analysis and stuff in time. Um, so anyway, that was Alexei Albu, who was a member of Barot, but Barot was a, um, it stands for struggle. It was a, gonna be a, a, a party in the parliament. Um, They're going through the, the uh, process of uh, that happening and uh, it got interrupted by the coup in 2014, um, which I know Margaret's gonna talk about too. Um, so the US sponsored coup in 2014 stopped all of that um, political work that was, that was being done. And especially if you were a socialist or a communist, and you were no longer allowed to even be in a party or, or um, say anything um, like that. Um, so anyway, uh, Alexei was one of the people who was um, in the Odessa fire. Uh, that's a fire in 2014. The fascists went and then set up the blaze, the trade union, the House of Trade Unions, killing socialists, uh, trade unionists, and none of, none of them ever got charged by Zelensky's government. Um, nothing happened there. But anyway, he escaped, and he escaped and he, uh, with his family to Crimea, and then he went back to Lugansk, and he's organizing in Lugansk. Um, So anyway, that's that 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 was what one thing is. And one thing to uh, to wrap this up is uh, what we learned from this trip is that uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, we know that the not only are the because uh, I have a lot of testimony from people talking about how the Azov Battalion and other uh, right sector folks were leading the military uh, in the occupied areas that they were in. Um, so not only is Nazi forces leading the military, um, they're also, um, the Ukrainian military is also consistently and systematically uh, targeting civilians. And this is something we never hear. And when the journalists in uh, Donbass uh, uh, talk about that, they get arrested. I just saw a list of five new journalists who were arrested because they're saying uh, what we saw uh, right here. Three media outlets were closed down, but one exists, uh, one media outlet called the Kiev Independent. And the reason it exists is because the National Endowment for Democracy, the European Endowment for Democracy, U.S. aid, and uh, the whole staff has been uh, you know, paid by NATO and CIA money 
well, they're in they're in uh, uh, um, in in Kiev, and they're giving the information. They get the information from the Azov Battalion and the videos. They send them to the CNN and New York Times and other places, and then uh, it's distributed as facts, just like they did during the weapons of, uh, during Iraq on uh, in regards to the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and um, thanks. Thank you, John. And next, um, Margaret Kimberly will share her analysis and talks on Donbass and Russia. Great. Hi, thank you all. Thank you so much. I'm Margaret Kimberly from uh, Black Alliance for Peace, um, uh, editor of Black and Gender Report. And I'm, uh, we included uh, some of John's reporting in recent issues of Black and Gender Report, so you should uh, look for those. Um, I, I wanted to open by reading a tweet that I wrote uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and I said, Ukraine is has lost. It can't defeat Russia. They can't contain or break up or weaken Russia without destroying the world economy. The $33 billion is a cash cow for defense contractors to continue a forever war. Phony concern for disinformation is to shut you up about all this. End quote. That's what I said, and I will go on to explain beyond the character limit what I meant. Um, uh, first, I want to thank John Parker for inviting me uh, to join this webinar today. Uh, he performed a great service in going to Russia and Ukraine and reporting on events. Uh, if we had real journalism instead of corporate-owned media, which act as State Department spokespeople, it wouldn't have been necessary for him to go at all. But that's not the situation, and so we appreciate his actions. Um, I think we should start with the discussion with some facts about Ukraine. It's not uh, this noble, independent nation with the heroic president uh, that's been portrayed by corporate media and politicians here. Ukraine is under the grip of far-right forces and kleptocrats, and it's a de facto colony of the U.S., which helped those far-right uh, forces overthrow the elected president in 2014. But the Donbass region in the east, mostly Russian speaking and left wing, and in, in fact, in some cases, still feeling a connection to the Soviet Union, resisted the coup government. And a civil war ensued, which resulted in more than 14,000 deaths. But the Minsk II agreement showed a path to peace. It was signed by Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and France, and was approved unanimously in the uh, UN Security Council in 2015. But Minsk II was never acted upon because the Obama administration and the Trump administration and the Biden administration did not want peace in Ukraine. They wanted to continue controlling it, to potentially make it a NATO member and use it as a weapon against Russia. Peace was not in their interest, and now it's very late. It's clear that Russian troops won't be leaving anytime soon, and they won't give up the territory they gained. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, for an explanation of how this was instigated, quote from an article, Black Agenda Report article that was written by Ajamu Baraka, which, which he entitled, Why the Russian Federation Recognized the Independent Movements in the Donbass. Uh, quote, Unfortunately, with the election of Joe Biden, who was the Obama administration's point person on Ukraine, the Democrats immediately picked up where the U.S. left off in 2016 and started to encourage the Ukrainian government to ignore the Minsk II agreement and to consider taking back the Donbass by force. Today, after the U.S. flooded Ukraine with weapons, um, uh, the deployment of 150,000 Ukrainian troops positioned along the contact line between Ukraine and Donbass and the shelling from the Ukrainian forces uh, right during the period that the U.S. predicted that Russia would invade, the Minsk agreement has become another casualty of war. On February 18th, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated he was alarmed by a reported spike in Ukrainian artillery attacks against rebels in the eastern Donbass. Uh, also reports from the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. 
uh, which had the task of monitoring and reporting on violations of in, the agreement, uh, reported some 591 ceasefire violations on February uh, 19th and 20th alone in Donetsk and in Lugansk, 975, unquote. And having given that background, I, I want to talk about the Black radical tradition and how uh, it impacts our analysis of Ukraine. And to say quite clearly that Black people should not be on the side of the U.S. and NATO. No one calling themselves a leftist of any kind should do so either. NATO is the cause of great suffering around the world and is not the defensive organization that it uh, claims to be. It's an aggressor, aggressor and often operates far from the North Atlantic region it claims to protect. NATO has brought destruction to millions of people from Ukraine to Libya to Afghanistan. NATO nations back coups and other interventions interventions in Africa, occupying Haiti and act as U.S. proxy. The South American nation of Colombia, far from the North Atlantic, has been designated a NATO partner nation. More broadly speaking, we should always be anti-imperialism. Imperialism is personified by the U.S. and its allies. The U.S. is the empire in this story. The U.S. has the world reserve currency, 800 military bases around the world, and spends more on defense than the next 11 nations combined, 10 times more than Russia spends, by the way. So uh, we have to be clear in our opposition to U.S. Uh, foreign policy, even as we're exhorted to identify with this government and its actions. We're always told that certain foreign leaders leaders are good or bad when the criteria is nothing more than adherence to U.S. policy. For years, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has been vilified as uh, uh, a tyrant, a dictator, a modern-day Hitler who allegedly stole the 2016 election for Trump. He didn't, but that's another story. Um, people who call themselves journalists routinely ask if he's a killer or a war criminal. The end result is any narrative that explains Russia's position is dismissed. But that means Russia's concerns about U.S. Plant placing an anti-Russian governments on its border is also ignored. That the expansion of NATO and its implications for Russia are ignored. Russia itself has been declared Ill illegitimate so that, uh, and I thought this was from The Onion, but it was actually true, Russian cats can't compete in international cat shows. Um, the Boston Marathon violated civil rights law, by the way, in banning Russian athletes from its competition. Um, a, an event celebrating the history of space exploration removed the name of Yuri Gagarin, who was the first human in space from their program. The media are not just ratcheting up hatred for Russia, they are cheerleaders for war. So-called journalists ask if uh, we should call Putin's bluff and risk war with another nuclear power. I, I think we have to talk about Zelensky, about Ukraine and its leadership versus what we have been told. Zelensky, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky was the hand-picked candidate of a Ukrainian oligarch named Igor Kolomoisky. Kolomoisky is a citizen of Ukraine, Israel, and Cyprus. He owns a television net network which featured the actor Zelensky in a comedy about a Ukrainian president. Kolomoisky himself was sanctioned by the U.S. government for involvement in significant corruption. He and other billionaires um, looted a bank in Ukraine, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in history, and then purchased pop properties in small Midwestern towns in the U.S. to launder money. Uh, and... Um, I, I think it's important to point this out so that we don't believe uh, what we're told uh, at, or and what we're told about Zelensky himself, who has closed down opposition newspapers, opposition television stations, declared uh, most political parties illegal. So everything we've been told is uh, not true and the blue and yellow flags being shoved down our throats are an indication of war propaganda. Um, that I've never seen before in uh, my life. And if Zelensky was put in office by a crook, then by definition, he can't be the man we're told we ought to respect and who gets standing ovations with addresses to Congress and the Grammys and the Cannes Film Festival. 
Uh, and you can't talk about Ukraine without talking about the efforts to close off discussion and eliminate every narrative except the one that's pushed by the US and its allies. And of course, I'm talking about censorship. The word used to promote censorship though is disinformation. Um, a couple of times in twice in April, Barack Obama spoke about disinformation, first at the University of Chicago and then at Stanford. He claimed that democracy is at risk because of social media. Democracy is at risk, but not because of anybody's tweets about Ukraine. Uh, his words were really meant to frighten Americans into accepting censorship uh, uh, should anybody dare to present a narrative that differs from the state. And um, uh, that's what he did. He's, now, when he talked about disinformation, he didn't mention Ukraine. He talked about Trump's claims of election fraud and racist posts and things that liberals would support. But um, uh, no, but Trump and the right aren't the targets. The left are the targets. And the need to silence the public about Ukraine was the reason for these efforts to address an issue con concocted by the Democratic establishment. Um, and less than one week after the Stanford speech, the Department of Homeland Security announced the establishment of a disinformation governance board. Of course, they needed Ob Obama to lay the groundwork with his disinformation tour. Of course, only those of us on the left and conservatives uh, spoke about the danger in what some called a ministry of, tr of truth as uh, described in Orwell's 1984. And while the Republicans who are thought of as lesser lights and the butt of liberal jokes, such as Representative Lauren Boebert spoke out against this very problematic uh, ent entity, but liberals said nothing at all. Bernie Sanders, House members known as the squad and others thought of as progressives or leftists were silent. And while Democrats go along with and defend every Biden administration policy, Republicans held a press conference to share their concerns. Uh, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and others uh, sought to defund the board, which actually didn't happen at all because they messed up their own PR effort. They, they didn't have enough good propaganda to defend their propaganda. But they needed, they needed this uh, in order to, their goal is to discredit anyone who tries to oppose their state narratives, especially now when the Ukraine crisis needs a constant supply of public buy-in. But the question has to be asked about liberal silence. It, there was a time when they would be the first to oppose government overreach, including any efforts to control discourse or even give an appearance of limiting what was deemed acceptable to speak and write. But liberals are joined at the hip with the Democratic Party. And that means they are the worst purveyors of misinformation and the group most interested in censorship. Um, now Ukraine is the focus of their uh, attack and the Biden administration needs to misdirect attention from its instigation of the crisis. By the way, I wanted to mention one thing. Do you remember in January uh, when the, they kept saying Russia's going to invade, Russia's going to invade? And then Biden said, it was very odd. He said, well, if it's a little mini incursion, that's not so bad. And it was very strange. And people wondered if Joe was being confused again. But I think he gave the game away. They instigated this, but they did not get what they wanted. Uh, but they want the public to accept every claim without question and believe that Putin is evil, that uh, the Ukrainian military can defeat the bigger, better equipped and better staffed Russian army and keep silent when 40, another $40 billion is spent on this effort. They don't want the public to question why their needs are deemed too expensive while Ukraine is turned into a forever war and a cash cow for the military industrial complex. Biden's force to create stupid expressions like Putin's price hikes to explain sanctions that can't hurt Russia, but hurt Americans. And liberals are at the heart of this um, problem. It's Democrats who have the power to declare certain thoughts unthinkable and make sure that inconvenient narratives are not heard. 
Um, so you can sneer at Lauren Boebert or McCarthy or anybody else, but uh, they have more to say for themselves than Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And the people making fun of Republicans would be far more effective if they made demands of fake heroes in the liberal class. But uh, of course, if they did that, they wouldn't be liberals. They just would be true leftists. Um, at Black Alliance for Peace, we released a statement, several statements actually, on Ukraine, in which we said that we need to decenter Europe, even as we talk about a crisis in Europe and talk about imperialism. Imperialism creates victims, not just in the targeted nation, but in the imperial core itself. European nations have endangered their own energy supply. That is to say, Russian natural gas in order to follow the dictates of the US. In fact, the Biden administration instigated the crisis in order to sever European ties with Russia. They wanted to kill the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project between Germany and Russia. Now a new and unfortunately inexperienced German leadership has acted against its country's interests. They comically run all over the world seeking replacement for the most logical and least harmful source of energy, Russian natu natural gas, and create dependence on US uh, frack gas, which would be more expensive and worse for the environment. But uh, the Biden administration, I think it's important to point out, they're also not very smart. They actually believed, uh, you know, what John McCain said about Russia just being a gas station masquerading as a country and nonsense like that. The Russian economy is clearly integrated with the West, the rest of the world. It's not wholly dependent upon oil and gas. And in case anybody doubted that, the ruble has actually gone up in value since sanctions were imposed. But the rest of the world is suffering. Um, a few weeks ago, I read that the domestic flights were temporarily postponed in Nigeria because gas prices are too high. And that's the way the market works. They always talk about the market, right? Supply and demand. If Russian energy is sanctioned, um, uh, the cost of uh, the supply is less and the cost of fuel goes up. Fertilizer, there are people all over the world who can't afford fertilizer. Food supplies are shrinking and prices are high because Russia and, UK and Ukraine are both major grain exporters. I will close by saying that Russia's winning. Donbass is nearly completely taken. Mariupol is taken. Uh, Liman is taken. The Avastal plant is taken. Sverdonetsk is probably next. And all talk of a Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kar Kharkiv was made up out of whole cloth. In the past week, Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz and other European leaders have called Vladimir Putin late in the day uh, to do what should have been done for the past eight years, engage in good faith negotiations. Now they are waiting to fight to the last Ukrainian, as it were, with Ukrainians dying in large numbers as Russia methodically dismantles its military. It's no accident that the New York Times implied that talks should take place and that Henry Kissinger said the same thing and added that Ukraine should accept that its territory is lost. By the way, I know Kissinger should burn in hell if he ever passes away, but it's significant that he said these words so publicly and at the World Economic Forum in Davos, no less. All claims of Ukrainian victory are just whistling past the graveyard. But we don't need the New York Times or Kiss Kissinger to validate our views. I assume everybody in this meeting is an anti-imperialist and that we must continue in that vein, telling the truth about Ukraine and about the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we're gonna begin um, question and answers, but first I wanted to make a few announcements. Um, where I'll be really taken to task on this. One is a very important announcement that Struggle La Lucha is um, in the process of publishing and will be publishing a book on particularly Donbass. Um, many people are probably on this call familiar with Greg Butterfield, who's been covering um, that struggle for a very, very long time, since 2014. And it's it's been neglected by a lot in the movement. And so we're going to be publishing a book and we'll be getting that information out to people. Um, and again, people can go to strugglelucha.org 
um, to pick up on any, because I know that John wasn't able to get all of the video up there. Uh, some of those videos are already up there on Struggle Lelouch's webpage. So please go there and subscribe if you can. So I'm asking people to try um, to move forward, John. Yeah, if we can just, um, while people are getting and questions and ready or stuff, like I have this video ready again now. So Oh, okay. You want to share that? Yeah. Cool. Let's share my screen. Um, Hit the... Um, and start. Let's see. And this is in one of the places uh, that the Ukrainian military had. <laughs> if I were to take the paint to see how old this is. I could like scrape some paint off and possibly analyze it and see how old. Um, I don't understand. Uh, you mean, when do take, you know, if I were if I were to take something and scrape it off and hold it, and ah, you, it you, you, you to analyze how old it is um, to see where it was written. But uh, it was written when Ukrainian soldiers were here, not now. Right, right, right. But I, I wonder if I could test that. Uh, okay. Licking my finger here. Uh, let's do that like that. Let's rub it really hard and see. Oh, nothing came off. Which means more likely <laughs> somebody didn't just come in. It's not new. And this symbol here. Is that... Uh, uh, this uh, symbol means um, uh, like a uh, circling of the sun. It, this symbol used uh, pagans, pagans, and uh, uh, so you see that the uh, fascist symbol is very similar to this. It is uh, 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 like a, a sun uh, turning of the sun. And this the same, but in the another uh, direction. In another, in another direction, yes, uh, and. Uh, so uh, here you can see that this place used uh, far right uh, forces. But there are other people who use that. Okay. Okay. That's it. I'm sorry. And so, you know, there, and we found other evidence like that. Um, uh, there was a, there's a, a right wing soccer team. I think that's where the right sector name came from. And that was plastered on some other walls. I forgot the name of it. Uh, Oh, shoot. Anyway, but um, there's lots of evidence. Um, some folks had found, um, you know, books like Mein Kampf <laughs> that were left over and things like that. And and just to let people know, this isn't the first time that the U.S. has assisted Nazi forces around the world. You know, this isn't the first time. And it just tells you about the nature, like what Margaret was talking about, talking about the nature of NATO, the most belligerent, uh, the dangerous uh, organization and violent organization, military alliance the world has ever seen. Um, and so it's, we shouldn't be surprised when, you know, as soon as the Warsaw, Warsaw Pact was dissolved, uh, they dis they took advantage of that in 1999, bombed 10,000 homes in Yugoslavia, bombed passenger trains, uh, killing Chinese journalists, doing, and then all the other havoc they've wreaked in the destruction of Libya and the millions killed and the 500,000 in Iraq. So nobody should be surprised about them cynically using Ukraine uh, as a proxy war against Russia. That's it. Thank you, John. Um Margaret, did you want to say anything before we I am I read the first question? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, emphasize what I was uh, saying. We need to call for the dismantling of NATO. Um, so obviously, Ukraine doesn't need to be a member of NATO, but nobody need there doesn't need to be a NATO. It was supposed to be defensive and defend against the Soviet Union, which you know, collapsed 30 years ago, and its uh, Warsaw Pact nations are now part of NATO. So we don't need it at all. Uh, and so that needs to be a point of our advocacy all the time. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and read the first thing. It's the question is by, uh, from Teresa Alamin. Have the panelists seen the film Donbass made by a Ukrainian filmmaker and aided by the EU, but billed as an anti-war satiric film? 
but it's clearly propaganda. I, I've not seen it. I'm not aware of it. John? Um, what was it called? I'm sorry. It's a film, you've seen the film Donbass, made by a Ukrainian filmmaker. Oh, no, I haven't seen it. I, Teresa, I don't think anyone saw it. I think if you want to put in chat what it's about, that's cool. And the other question is, uh, will we reconfigurate the chat so it can be saved and individual posts can be copied? Yes, we'll do our very best on that. I mean, I know there was a there was a film that um, it was in, in response to um, Oliver Stone's film. I think was that in response to that. I think it was in response to that. And um, so, of course, they use the same misinformation that. Um, we, you know, it's interesting that the, when the when this thing first happened, uh, they're saying that the Russian, uh, the palace, the Israeli bombing the Palestinians. Uh, they were showing pictures of that, and oh, oh no, that was uh, they. They were saying, "Oh, that's the Russians bombing the uh, Ukrainians," but it was actually the Israelis bombing the Palestinians. And they're using all kinds of tricks like that, and I think they kind of use that kind of information in those kinds of films. Yes. Um, any other questions or comments that people have? There's tons of stuff that's been written in chat. Okay, here's too many messages. So um, I'm just going to read this if somebody wants to be thinking about the question. Uh, Galaxy Notes. I don't know who Galaxy Notes is, but I don't think that's a person. <laughs> I actually voted no to NATO, like most BOSCs. But the Spanish majority voted in favor, and we boss are an unwilling member of NATO ever since. Thank you, and I'm sorry that I didn't. There was no name on the actual post. Um, anybody else have a question? Okay, we have another question here. Okay, the next question is by Dan. Um, the average voter seems to care more about the pocketbook issues than foreign policy. How would you convince them of the economic harm done to them by Washington's response? Great question. John or Margaret, whoever wants to go. Uh, well, you know, we have to we have to fight against the war propaganda. Um, you know, we have inflate. Well, the biggest reason we have inflation in the country is uh, corporate profit making. But uh, fuel prices have gone up because of the sanctions against Russia. The sanctions to get to hurt Russia are hurting the rest of the world. And uh, it's no accident that the same people uh, who are, are trying to harangue and indoctrinate us um, don't talk, don't tell us this very simple truth. Russia has, has been hurt by sanctions. I'm not saying they have not been, but they really believed they were going to destroy Russia's economy. They really thought that was going to happen. And I just want to emphasize something I said. We're dealing with an administration that's just not very smart. And they um, believe things that are frankly just fantasy. Um, and uh, so I think it's important for us to tell people, and this, this, all this propaganda, the blue and yellow flag, Zelensky everywhere, they have to keep this lie going. Because you might say, well, what happened to the child tax credit or what happened to the COVID relief? They're trying to tell you it should go to the police. Um, what, you know, what, what happened to uh, money to help the people? So Biden is really stuck because there was all this propaganda in his favor. He's more progressive than anybody since FDR. He's cut child poverty in half. Not true, not true. Um, and now they're constantly sending uh, public money, stealing public resources, for the military industrial complex in uh, Ukraine. So I would just keep it very simple. Um, you know, the military budget, it's, it's, it's most of discretionary spending and it's why we can't have nice things in this country. It, it literally is. And at a time when people have such great need, the fact that it's all going to Raytheon and McDonnell Douglas and whoever the hell else uh, in Ukraine is um, a betrayal of uh, the American people and what they expected to happen when they made what they were told was this big ch change by putting Biden in office. Thank you. John, yeah. you want to add something? Yeah, you know, that's absolutely. Um, and it goes to the other question, too, about um, the reluctance of being a NATO state, because the people in these, these countries uh, uh, like Margaret saying, are, are suffering economically 
because of these policies, but it also gives us an opportunity to, like the other question was leading to, uh, an, uh, an opportunity to, um, to, to heighten those contradictions and to heighten the divisions between the NATO countries because they're people. Um, uh, you know, we got to talk, talk about the fact that, you know, it's like, uh, like Margaret was saying, that inflation's the highest it's ever been in 40 years. Um, and you know, it's affecting everyone here. It's affect, especially affecting people in the developing world. But um, here as, as well, people are more people are going to be homeless. More people are, are suffering. They can't get enough food. Um, so all of these things are so important in um, getting solidarity with our working class and fighting on those struggles when they start getting evicted and they start and all these other kinds of things. And with inflation, they're going to try to use um, unemployment to fix it instead of instead of doing what they need to do to, to increase the the, uh, the supply chain by uh, manufacturing jobs on bridges, making more hospitals, doing making baby formula <laughs> factories. Richest country in the world, we don't have enough baby formula. Um, so they, they, we, we have to point out these things that, that things can be done right now to help and they're not being done. Instead, Biden is hurting in so many ways in, in terms of COVID. A million people have died in this country because of COVID, over a million because of the recklessness. And Biden has the nerve to send $16 billion of COVID relief to Ukraine for the to, so Ukrainian Nazis can, you know, play with their guns over there. And then and then he goes to Ed, Ed uh, what's this guy, Eric Adams in, in New York, the mayor of New York, the guy who likes black cops who kill black people. That's the kind of... Uh, yeah, Eric Adams, I think he's in there. Um, that he, uh, uh, um, he went and met with him and told him, you know, the federal money that we got, they got ARPA funds and CARES fund. He said, uh, instead of using that federal money for what it's supposed to be for COVID relief is what it's supposed to be, uh, use it to hire more cops. He told him that, you know, so he really likes to fund white supremacy, whether it's from those, these racist cops killing our, our children or whether it's the Ukrainian people, uh, the Ukrainian uh, Nazis leading the military there. Thank you, John. We have a whole lot of questions. Oh, from yeah, I have a, I wanted to respond to somebody in the chat who said they weren't actually asking a question about a movie, but about uh, Black Alliance for Peace appearing to support Putin. Uh, we don't support uh, anybody. We always support the people. We support people all over their world, all over the world, and their right to be free from U.S. and NATO uh, aggression. But uh, you know, the the facts are the facts. It is the U.S. insistence upon trying to use uh, Ukraine to attack Russia that has caused this problem. And I think that one can make that statement because it's absolutely true. That's what the uh, Secretary of Defense said, did he not? We're trying to weaken Russia. So uh, pointing that out is not to uh, say that we support a particular state. We are just telling the truth as it is. Thank you, Margaret, for clarifying that. Now we got a lot of questions and I don't know where to start. And there's been some in chat. I don't know if it's okay with John and Margaret, if I read a couple of them and then you all can kind of cherry pick back and forth and we'll just make sure that we deal with everyone's question just because of time. Um, our question is, and I'm gonna not gonna stop at this. Our question, is there an authentic independence movement in Donbass or was this a fig leaf for Russian annexation of Donbass? That's one question if y'all wanna jot it down or anything or just if you're better than me, keep it in your head. The other is um, any comments on the history, Operation Bloodstone, Reinhard, Gellin, O-U-N in the 1950s. And then they have blowback by Christian, Christopher Simpson. And then there's two more questions and I apologize. And John or Margaret, you can go and ask me to reread some of this. Um, in addition to educational Zoom meetings like this, I think this question goes with my heart. What other ways can we help bring together genuine anti-war forces. We need a wide coalition of conscious orgs and individuals who have a long time analysis of Ukraine, Russia. Can we bring the other forces in US, Canada, Europe, who are so much clearer on this issue? And oh my gosh, I didn't know there's even more. And uh, Cleo, and that's by Ellen, Eleanor Amami, Mani. And then Cleo Carol Knopf asks, how do we show the connection between the support for Nazis in Ukraine and Nazis in America? It seems with more mass shootings that the menace we support in Ukraine is coming home. 
there's too many others. I'm going to stop there because, you know, unless you want me to keep going, I think John and Margaret, they're all divergent questions. You want me to stop? Yeah, I'll just okay. start. Um, I, I don't know about Operation Bloodstone. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what that is, so I can't answer the question. Uh, what other ways can we bring uh, anti-war forces together? Um, and we can, you know, um, I, I don't know that anti-war forces in Europe are so much clearer on this issue. This uh, propaganda is worldwide, and there are many people, in Germany, the Green Party, who we think of as being left, um, are uh, the ones who are most warlike against Russia, who were most adamant about canceling the um, Nord Stream 2 agreement, which um, uh, hurt their country so very badly. But yes, we do need to be in solidarity internationally. Um, and someone mentioned the support for Nazis in the U.S. I did not mention the uh, John did uh, touch on the fact that, you know, they're trying to walk it for years. Uh, I'll give you an example. The New York Times for years called the Azov Battalion neo-Nazi. Now they just call them right wing. Um, there's a long history of, um, of during the war of collaboration with Nazis in, excuse me, in uh, Ukraine um, and there are, you know, this black sun symbol, the, the troops they've captured with these swastika tattoos and the black sun. They had to start airbrushing all the black sun symbols off of uh, photos of uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers. And yes, the shooter in Buffalo who uh, two weeks ago killed two, 10 uh, people, the white supremacist killer, also sported a black sun. Uh, there are white supremacists and far right groups who go to Ukraine to be trained. So there is um, a direct uh, connection. As far as breaking free from the duopoly of Democrats and Republicans, just do it. Stop voting for them. Uh, that's my simple answer. But uh, someone points out not we should not be afraid to support the Russian people supporting. Yeah, we just have to support, we have to oppose imperialism. And I think that's where our focus needs to be. We don't have to and speak out against U.S. interventions. And we don't have to pick sides and say this one is good or this one is bad. Speak up for humanity. Speak out against imperialism. John? Yeah. <laughs> 100% agree. <laughs> um, I don't know what to say after Margaret speaks. I was like, okay. hey, she doesn't speak everything. But and, uh, um, on the, uh, on the thing I about... You, John. Uh, well, uh, go uh, ahead, but I, there's a question. Yeah. I can you also. Okay. But on the, um, uh, on the Lugansk thing, uh, the thing about the, uh, how much of the, the military is, oh, are there really independent folks or is it just a ploy and things like that? Well, you know, for the, the reason that the Lugansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic, um, founded themselves and wanted to be independent it was because after 2014 in the coup, these Nazi forces were getting more prominence, uh, becoming more of a terrorist threat. Like I said, they burnt that. Uh, they burned alive almost 40 people in the Odessa trade unions. Um, and they said, we don't want any part of this. And they were mostly a Russian speaking population in the Donbass region. And they wanted to be independent, um, which was, you know, made a lot of sense. Um, but the Lugansk militia, uh, Lugansk people's militia, they were doing 100% of the fighting before February. They had Russian uh, advisors, but the, um, the forces up until February 22nd, 23rd, before the Russian intervention happened, it was just Lugansk people because they always try to make it sound like, oh, this is just Russia doing this. That's just more of the U.S. propaganda trying to justify their mm -hmm. their imperialism. Um, and the other thing about the, um, I don't know about the Bloodstone operation, but I do know about the Operation Lusitania in 1915 to get the U.S. into World War I. And then the Operation Gulf of Tonkin to get the U.S. into the Vietnam War and what happened after that. You know, two million Vietnamese killed, 500,000 uh, agent uh, suffering uh, permanently from Agent Orange and other horrors like that. And we, of course, we know about the uh, operations and well, um, weapons of mass destruction 
you know, they they did some things like they'd have a warehouse full of uh, um, the soldier U.S. soldiers, and they they go into this warehouse, and it was they said, oh, this warehouse is full of chemical weapons. It'd come out with maybe some baby, uh, so they wouldn't allow the journalists to go in to see what was going on, and so they probably came out with some you know baby powder or something. Said, hey, this is anthrax, but they the New York Times published it as facts. These they were just lying and. You know, Time and again, uh, the New York Times, throughout the from the Lusitania to the Gulf of Tonkin, you can find a lot of different newspapers. But definitely, the New York Times, the paper of record, would publicize these things as if they're they're true and sell the war. And the New York Times had to apologize, um, and they said, "Well, you know, the reason it happened was because we weren't verifying our facts." Um, it seems like a paper should do that, but they do it over again. They're doing it now. <laughs> So they're, they're just a tool, like Margaret said, they're just a tool of the Pentagon. It's just when they seem objective, but when war, when imperialist war starts, uh, no, they're just a tool of the Pentagon. And in terms of the Nazis, um, uh, uh, few, the, the Nazi problem that's coming here, New York Times, and they're not New York Times, Newsweek and this German paper called Die Zeit, um, they did some articles, uh, I think in January, about the threat of the Nazis in Ukraine. And it turns out that 17,000 white supremacists have gone through the Ukraine and gotten military training. And then they go back and they use it against us. Um, and it's, it's just become a hotbed of, of, of fascism there. Um, and I, I and you know, finally, though, this is one, one of the people I interviewed in the shelters, this woman, she was, looked like she was in her late 80s. Um, she was by herself. Um, she had lost everything because they took everything, bombed everything. She said, everything I have is on this bed. All she had was a pillowcase and sheets and things like that. And you, if you could see the misery in her eyes. And when I asked, um, uh, you know, what would you, what, what would you do if the Russian soldiers that were here now, um, if they left? She said, I'd be very afraid. So people in the anti-war movement here who are, who are saying this is a Russian invasion and they're condemning Russia, put yourself in the place of the people from Donbass, whose children for eight years have been terrorized and probably killed, Some, many of them killed, 14,000 killed. They're under this the threat of rape, terror, murder, bombings for eight years. And when on February 22nd, the, the uh, Ukrainian military was at the border, ready to come in. They were ready to finish the job. It was going to be genocide and a humanitarian crisis. They were, didn't they? Didn't the people of Donbass have a right to ask for help? Wouldn't you ask for help if your children are about to get slaughtered? And they took it. And 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 Russia, basically, it had a responsibility to, to, to meet that demand, to, to help them, you know? So we should think twice about that. I, you know, think about the people who are suffering from U.S. imperialism historically, and what they were going through before you start throwing accusations of invasion and con condemnation. That's it. Exactly. And yes, John, and I just wanted to add to that, um, you know, the had the U.S. Um, forced the Ukraine, because Ukraine does whatever the U.S. wants, all they had to do was follow the Minsk II agreement that they signed. Uh, and that was necessary. It acknowledged that Donbass um, should have some sort of autonomy. It acknowledged language rights because they were banning the Russian language, among other things. But the U.S. didn't really want peace. And I, I think it's, it's very important. And I know people on the left differ in uh, uh, their opinions about um, uh, whether the Russians should have gone in militarily. You still need to know why this happened. You still need to know the history. You still need to know how it was instigated. And I'm just looking at the chat. And um, yes, I, I know about the Nazi and Nazi collaborators. Um, uh, being used to undermine the USSR, uh, some of them being given U.S. and Canadian citizenship, especially Canada. The um, She was the foreign minister. She's now, I think, deputy prime minister of Canada. Her father was one of those, grandfather was one of those Ukrainian collaborators. So that is not something that uh, um, the, uh, uh, that is just uh, Putin's propaganda. Thank you, Margaret. John, there's a question that says, what was John's impression, if any, of the, degree, of the degree to which the average Ukrainian and Russian understand NATO to be the ultimate cause of the conflict? Um, 
I, I think, yeah, they, uh, most people see it, see, saw it as the U.S. that's funding this um, funding. Most people, I think, see in Ukraine anyway, see the 2014 as something that was funded by the U.S. And, and it's, it makes sense because there's a lot of National Endowment for Democracy money there. And, um, and, and what they did was they hire young people and then they go out and, and they probably did some positive things like saying, let's, let's fight against the oligarchs, let's do all this kind of stuff. And then, and, and they get a grouping around them and then they were being used for propaganda for the U S. So, um, yeah, I even saw this thing on a wall. It said ACAB. It was in, it was written in the English letters, not the, you know, the Russian letters, but it was ACAB. And, and I, I asked, um, Alexi, what, what is this? All cops are bad. Oh, I said, yeah, that's a really progressive slogan here. <laughs> they were taking U.S. slogans that we use and then using them in Ukraine uh, uh, for the opposite reason. But they were taking kind of Western culture kind of thing and doing that stuff. So I think a lot of people saw that. Uh, I see a question about uh, Ukrainians and Russians and Belarusians who oppose the Russian military operation. And uh, what do we think of them? I think they should have been respected by the Minsk II agreement being um, respected. That would have respected their views. Ending this war, having serious negotiations, that would have uh, kept this from happening. And now they're panicking. And uh, now that um, uh, Ukraine is clearly losing, they, some of them are calling Putin. Now, somebody else asked about the fractures in the European Union. Um, uh, Italy has publicly said, the, I think the prime minister met um, uh, with Biden and, and said there should be negotiations. Uh, the UK is the biggest, um, uh, it's always the biggest US puppet, very happily so. And the one that mimics um, uh, uh, US uh, opinions on, uh, 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 on this situation. In fact, Ukraine had agreed to some concessions and they sent Boris Johnson personally to meet with Zelensky and tell him no, 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 and get his mind right and tell him not to do this. But this means people die. So um, that is the most important thing. This, this did not have to happen. Uh, I believe it is the fault of the U.S. and um, the U.K. in particular um, but yes, there are fractures in the EU because they can't get out of this mess they made for themselves. They can't live without Russian gas. They are not going to crater the ruble. They are hurting themselves. The U.S. is asking, asking countries all over the world to shoot themselves in the foot. Oh, don't buy Russian gas. And India said, actually, no, we screwed ourselves uh, when you told us not to buy Iranian oil. So we're going to do what we want. And countries, by the way, there were votes in the UN condemning Russia and kicking Russia off of the pretend Human Rights Council. And many countries abstained. Uh, many African countries abstained. So this, um, this trope of Russia being isolated is nonsense. That just means the U.S. doesn't like Russia. But there are countries who have openly defied the U.S. Um, and I want to say again that Biden and his people are are fantasists, if they think China is going to break its strategic partnership with Russia to please them. So. Thank you, Margaret. And Maude, you're still speaking. There is a question to you. It says, Margaret, can you speak about the fracture in the European Union nation members as it relates to sanctions against Russia? Which you partially. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I, yeah, I, was, uh, I yeah. was addressing that. You have yeah. some like Italy saying, let's talk. Right. Uh, some like you, well, they're not EU, but European nation, the UK or the most hawkish. Uh, Macron, Emmanuel Macron wants to talk to Putin a lot, but not really offer much. So, um, but as, as the longer this goes on, <clears throat> the more dissension you will see amongst them, because nothing that they hoped would happen has happened. Great. I'm going to read a few questions, if it's okay for folks. Um, just, and some of it people may answer or not. Uh, Ruth Strauss says, just repeating here, wow, great, this, how great this webinar is. We would like to contribute to each org, but please do save the chat. We will do that and post a link somewhere to it to send it to registrants 
um, since it has a lot of important links to all of your work, writings, et cetera. Thanks again. We will do it. And actually, after this is, you know, once we're finished with the webinar, we'll get this out to everybody. Um, are there any good, good historical books that can help us understand what is going on in Ukraine? Right? Because I can remind people we're going to publish something from Craig Butterfield, but others have their answers. And how do we get to Americas, Americans who consider themselves progressives who refuse to listen to any other narrative but the mainstream narrative that Putin is evil? Stop there. Either one of you, John or Michael. Um. Oh, I was thinking. <laughs> I was, I was, my mind was wandering for a second, but, but uh, um, the evil Putin thing, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's the same as the the that they do every kind. They, they the first thing they do when they um, want to go to war is they vilify the the target of U.S. imperialism, um, and it's and like. Um, like Margaret was saying, this is this is uh, something that they promoted. This was a serious provocation. They knew what they were doing. Um, they knew since 1990 when Gorbachev was stupid enough to, um, to unilaterally disarm and take take away Warsaw. We saw what happened after that. Um, and um, but they were told Gorbachev was given promises, and, and there's Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, documents now that we see that this is true, that he was time and again from the U.S. leaders, from Western European leaders that uh, we will not go east. And he said, we won't go east and we won't even expand NATO. We're not going to make any more NATO states. Don't worry about it. Disband, disband Warsaw. So he did. And now 20 years later, 20 and 20 years, they've doubled. NATO has doubled. And they doubled by surrounding themselves around the then Soviet Union, now Russia. And Ukraine was just the last straw. You're gonna have a you're gonna have a, a NATO member state with possible nuclear uh, uh, capability that can reach Moscow in five minutes, and not only that, led by neo Nazis. Um, imagine if the Taliban went to uh, in Afghanistan, took over, had the money, the U.S. money, and they had $100 billion and they took over Canada and it was an anti-U.S. government and they had nuclear weapons and the uh, people leading the military was Al-Qaeda. What would the U.S. do? So they knew this was a provocation. They, they're, In fact, three years ago, the RAND Corporation, which is a CIA think tank, laid out the whole scenario of what they're doing right now. So we know this is so when they start vilifying Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi or any the latest, what they always call him the brutal dictator, the brutal dictator. I mean, talk about brutal. Biden just stopped the um, uh, he just froze the assets of Afghanistan, nine point five billion dollars. And that's going to cause one million children to starve to death. Biden is starving one million children to death, but nobody calls him a brutal dictator or insane. It's just, wow, it's too much. 